God, 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 God. This went on for one hour and 15 seconds with 140 direct references to God. Then this happened. What do we mean by the term God? So I would ask both of you gentlemen, but before. Before we get go too much further, and we're going to agree or disagree whether Jesus is God or not, because that, that's the central argument, right? Um, what exactly do both of you gentlemen uh, mean when you say God? Because we may we may disagree about uh, what what we mean by God, and therefore we we, we prove our both of our points. Uh, but what what do you gentlemen mean by the by the term or title God, and how do you arrive at that definition? You just took the words right out of my mouth. This is the issue. But even after Andrew Griffin's logical request, no good, clear, and simple definition of the word God was given. Just more God, 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 God. For the remaining one hour, 43 minutes, and 52 seconds. I, along with Matt Slick, agree that it's a good idea to define what we mean by the word God, especially when we're talking about God and debating about God for two hours. 44 minutes and 15 seconds, but he and the other debaters failed to do that in this debate. You can check out the video for yourself. A link is in the description of this video below. And I see it all too often, people talking about God without defining who they are talking about. Understanding what the word God means will shed much needed light on who the only true God is, and it will shed much needed light on some of the most controversial passages in the scriptures, which we will look at in this video. And by understanding what the word God means, we can see how Jesus is legitimately called God without having to be part of the mythical Christian trinity. First, understand the word God is not a name, but a title. It's a position. It's a title that tells us what anyone or anything with the title of God actually does. Just as the title manager tells us what the person does. He manages. So what exactly does a God do? Does he God? Is he busy with the business of Godding? That obviously does not work and provides zero clarity. As we can see, the word God is a very vague word. We need some clarity. I'm going to give you the definition of the word God. Then if your definition is different, I'll give you an opportunity to test your definition of the word God in two minutes and 26 seconds. Here is the good, clear, and simple definition of the word God, placer. The definition placer is based in the Greek language, which is the original language of the New Testament scriptures. The word God is the English translation of the Greek word theos. When the writers of the Greek scriptures quoted from the Hebrew scriptures, they used the Greek word theos to translate the Hebrew Elohim, revealing that these two words are the closest in meaning between the two languages. Hebrews 1, 8 through 9, written in Greek, is referencing Psalm 45, 6 through 7, which was written in Hebrew. Psalm 45, 6 through 7, from the concordant version of the Old Testament. Your throne, O Elohim, is for the eon and further. A scepter of equity is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of elation beyond your partners. Hebrews 1, 8 through 9. Yet to the Son, thy throne, O God, is for the eon of the eon, and the scepter of rectitude is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest injustice, therefore thou art anointed by God, thy God, with the oil of exaltation beyond thy partners. We see from these two passages that the Greek theos is used in Hebrews 1 to translate the Hebrew Elohim. Elohim, like Theos, is used not only of the only true God and of his Son, but is also used of many other Elohim slash Theoi slash gods, even false gods. This is how Jesus can be called God and also call his Father my God. They are both God while Jesus' Father is the only true God. They are both gods slash Elohim slash placers. And this is important. Trinitarians often point to Elohim in the plural being a proof of the Trinity. But notice here the plural 
plural Elohim is speaking of the singular Son and the singular Father, and the plural Elohim is translated by the singular Theos in the Greek scriptures. The plural Elohim is not support for the Trinity or the so-called Godhead. Before we see how we arrive at the definition placer for the word God, let's do a quick test of your definition of the word God to see if it fits some of the usual and unusual contexts. Keep in mind your definition must work with all the occurrences of the word God. John 17, 3. Now it is Aeonian life that they may know thee, the only true God, insert your definition of God here, and him whom thou dost commission, Jesus Christ. Does your definition of the word God fit here? 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. Now if our evangel, or good news, is covered, also it is covered in those who are perishing, in whom the God of this eon blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving, so that the illumination of the evangel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, does not irradiate them. Bonus! You get a two for one here. This is a great passage to test your definition of God, since it reveals two very different gods slash placers, who are both legitimate gods slash placers. We see the only true God, Jesus' invisible Father, and the God of this eon, who is blinding the unbelievers who are perishing so they don't apprehend the good news of Christ. The God of this eon is the adversary, aka Satan. Because he is the God of this eon, this eon is said to be the present wicked eon in Galatians 1.4. Does your definition of God work when applied to the Father and to Satan, the adversary? John 20, 28. And Thomas answered and said to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Philippians 3, 18 through 19. For many are walking, of whom I often told you, yet now am lamenting also as I tell it, who are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose consummation is destruction, whose God is their bowels, and whose glory is in their shame, who to the terrestrial are disposed. I'm really curious to see if your definition of God fits here. Many try to define the word God by listing attributes they think belong to the only true God eternal, triune, all-knowing, all-powerful, creator, etc., etc. Do these words describe your bowels? Here's another great test for your definition of God. John 10, 32-36. Jesus answered them, Many ideal acts I show you from my Father, because of what act of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For an ideal act we are not stoning you, but for blasphemy, and that you, being a man, are making yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law that I say, You are gods? If he said those were gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be annulled, are you saying to him whom the Father hallows and dispatches into the world that you are blasphemy? blaspheming, seeing that I said, Son of God, am I? This is our final test. Good luck. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Then concerning the feeding on the idol sacrifices, we are aware that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God except one. For even if so be that there are those being termed gods, whether in heaven or on earth, even as there are many gods and many lords, nevertheless for us there is one God, the Father, out of whom all is, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all is, and we through him. Does your definition of God fit the plurality of God? Gods in verse 5. This concludes our God definition test. If your definition of the word God did not fit properly with all those contexts, the rest of this video will provide you with some clarity. If your definition of God is different than Placer and it fit well with all of those contexts, please share your definition and how you arrived at it in the comments below. Let's now look at the reason Placer is the proper definition of the word God. Uh, you don't need to see that. Uh, let's see. If we go to BibleHub.com, then go to 1 Peter 1, 3, then we go to the English-Greek interlinear, we see the Greek words of the scriptures in light blue and the English translation in red. It's a little clunky when the English follows exactly with the Greek, but it says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord of us, Jesus Christ, the one, according to the great of him mercy, having begotten again us to a hope living through the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead. You can see that God is the English translation of the Greek theos. If I click on theos, 
we can see that Theos occurs as is in the Greek scriptures 311 times and 1327 times total in various forms. In the various forms we can see the same root for all variations. The root consists of two Greek letters, theta, which is equivalent to the English th, as in the word think, and epsilon, which is equivalent to the English e, as in the word very. Multiple suffixes alter the root to allow it to fit many different contexts, some of which are speaking of a singular god and some of a plurality of gods. When we click on Strong's Greek 2316, it takes us to the word theos, and its definition. We don't get a lot of help here. Under Strong's Concordance, we get nothing useful that clarifies just more God, 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 God. Under Help's Word Studies, it says Theos is of unknown origin, properly God, the creator and owner of all things, which isn't very helpful. If we put that definition of the word God to the test, it fails miserably. Is Satan or your bowels the creator and owner of all things? Help's Word Study also tells us long before the New Testament was written, number 2316, Theos referred to the supreme being who owns and sustains all things. This too fails to fit all the context of Theos. And the New American Standard Exhaustive Concordance does not bring clarity saying Theos is of uncertain origin. And that is true, there is uncertainty about the word Theos and where it comes from. If we scroll down to Thayer's Greek lexicon, we get some helpful info but not much clarity. We can see that there were eight or more proposed derivations of Theos, but Thayer's reveals only one, to supplicate, implore, hence the implored. That definition, the implored, can fit many contexts of Theos, but not all. Some ask or beg the only true God for things, likewise with Jesus, and some ask or beg Satan, the adversary, for things. But who asks or begs their bowels for anything? My neighbor Francine talks to the big rock in her front yard. Maybe she supplicates her bowels. Some of the other derivations that Thayer's alludes to include good, the one who works or does, desire, shine, creator, wise, brilliant, shake, award worthy, make appear, put on the light, do, make, bind, to tie, run in stormy haste. My bowels were running in stormy haste just this morning. <laughs> The Greek historian Herodotus, called the father of history, lived about 450 years before Christ and said Theos was derived from the Greek verb to thame. Dr. Spiros Zodiates wrote this regarding Theos. Theos, God, originally used by the heathen and adopted in the New Testament as the name of the true God. The most probable derivative is from the verb theo, to place, see to Thame, number 5087. The heathen thought the gods were disposers, the tires, placers, informers of all things. The ancient Greeks used the word both in the singular and the plural. In the plural, they intimated their belief that elements such as the heavens had their own disposer or placer, e.g. the god of money, called mammon. Let's look at the Greek verb to thame to see if it clarifies anything for us. Strong's Concordance and the New American Standard Exhaustive Concordance tells us to thame means to place, lay, set. And the New American Standard Concordance tells us to thame is from a primary root, th, which we saw earlier was the root of theos. So when we go from theos to to thame, we see a very, very strong connection here that leads us to the definition of theos, meaning placer. Let's look at a passage in the Greek scriptures that contains both Theos and Tethemi. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 and 27 through 28. Yet now God placed the members, each one of them, in the body according as he wills. Now you are the body of Christ and members of a part, whom also God indeed placed in the ecclesia, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, thereupon powers, thereupon graces of healing, supports, pilotage, species of languages. Here we see God godding, that is, placing. He is the one who sovereignly places the members of the body of Christ, each one of them, in the body according as he wills. If you're a nose in the body of Christ, it's only because God made you a nose and placed you there. Same for the pinky finger, the spleen, and the elbow. If you're in the body of Christ, you are exactly where God wants you to be. 
Acts 1, 6 through 7. Those indeed then who are coming together asked Jesus, saying, Lord, art thou at this time restoring the kingdom to Israel? Yet he said to them, Not yours is it to know times or heirs which the Father placed in his own jurisdiction. It's important to know the Father is not only putting everything in its proper place physically, but also everything in its proper place in time. He's determined the times and eras when all events in his creation will occur. Anything and everything and everyone in God's entire creation has its place, and everything and everyone in God's entire creation is in its exact proper place because the only true God placer has placed it there even the things that appear to us to be out of place. With placer as the simple and clear definition of the word God, we can now begin to clear up some of the issues regarding God, the mythical trinity, and other confusions based on unclear doctrines, which are often based on unclear definitions. We see that God, the only true God, who is the God of Jesus, is the only true placer when we look at some enlightening scriptures. Romans 11:36. Out of him and through him and into him is all. In this verse, we see the movement of all in the creation, including God's Son, out of God, through God, and into God. And all of this movement is the result of the only true placer, the God and Father of Jesus Christ. Even Christ himself is placed by his Father, the only true placer, meaning the only true source of all placing that occurs in the entire creation. John 17, 3. Now it is Aeonian life that they may know thee, the only true God, and him whom thou dost commission, Jesus Christ. Jesus acknowledges his Father as the only true God slash placer, the one who places all others, but is never placed by another. And we should acknowledge this also. The Father commissions his Son. The word commission is from the Greek verb apostello, which means literally from put. It means to send. The Father sent his Son as his apostle. In turn, Jesus sent his apostles and put them in place to do various tasks. Galatians 4, 4-6 now, when the full time came, God delegates his son, come of a woman, come under law, that he should be reclaiming those under law, that we may be getting the place of a son. Now, seeing that you are sons, God delegates the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Jesus' father is always placing his son, even now. Verse 4 tells us God delegated his son when he was born from Mary under the law. And verse 6 tells us God continues today to delegate the spirit of his son into our hearts and into the hearts of people when they are granted belief by God, who then have the place of a son. The Greek word translated twice in this passage as delegates is ex apostello. It is an active verb with the only true God slash placer doing the action. It it is a three-part word made of ex and apo and stello, and it means out from put, which means to send forth or send away. God placed his son on the earth to teach us and to die for all our sins. And he places the spirit of his son into our hearts when we are granted belief by God. Acts 17, 28. In him we are living and moving and are. If we are living and moving and are, with are meaning exist, it is only because of God, the placer of those who are living and moving and are, those who exist. This amazing truth sheds great light on a very interesting passage regarding death and resurrection in Luke 20. The words of Jesus in Luke 20, 37 through 38. Now that the dead are rousing, even Moses divulges at the thorn bush, as he is terming the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now God is he not of the dead, but of the living, for all to him are living. I've gone in depth on this passage in other videos. See the links in the description of this video and in the top pinned comment for this video. When we replace the word God with its true meaning, placer, this confusing passage becomes clearer. God is not the placer of the dead, including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't place them because they are dead, and the dead know nothing, and the dead do nothing. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 10. 
God places living people, as we just saw in Acts 17.28. Those who are living and moving and are. He doesn't place the dead because they are not living, not moving, and don't exist. The dead will live and move and exist only by resurrection, which is the theme of this passage in Luke. All to him are living because he is not bound by time. He tabernacles the future. So he is already there at the resurrection when the dead will become the living, the moving, and the existing. Thomas's words to the risen Savior, my Lord and my God, in John 20:28. 20, have caused great confusion among readers who have no clear definition of the word God. This lack of clarity has caused monotheistic Trinitarians to think if there is only one God and Jesus is God, then he must be part of a multi-person God who is a Trinity. Wrong. John 20, 14 through 17 and 26 through 28. Saying these things, Miriam slash Mary turned behind and is beholding Jesus standing, and she was not aware that it is Jesus. Jesus is saying to her, Woman, why are you lamenting? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing that he is the gardener, is saying to him, Lord, if you bear him off, tell me where you place him, and I will take him away. Jesus is saying to her, Miriam. Now being turned, she is saying to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which is the term for teacher. Jesus is saying to her, Do not touch me, for not as yet have I ascended to my Father. Now go to my brethren and say to them that I said, Lo, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Verse 26, And after eight days his disciples were again within, and Thomas was with them. The doors having been locked, Jesus is coming and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Thereafter he is saying to Thomas, Bring your finger here and perceive my hands, and bring your hand and thrust it into my side, and do not become unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. There are two gods slash placers in these verses. Jesus' father, who Jesus tells Miriam is my God and your God, and Thomas calls Jesus by the same phrase, my God. Is Jesus trying to steal followers from his father? No. This is simply an instance of the absolute and relative viewpoints in the scriptures. Relatively speaking, Jesus is Thomas's God his placer. But absolutely, Jesus' Father is Thomas's God, just as the Father is absolutely Jesus and Mary's God slash placer. This is similar to David's words from Acts 2, 34 through 35. For David did not ascend into the heavens, yet he is saying, said the Lord to my Lord, sit at my right till I should be placing thine enemies for a footstool for thy feet. Notice who is doing the placing here. We see one Lord, the Father, placing another Lord, his son at his right. David calls the lesser Lord, my Lord. Of the two gods mentioned here in John 20, which one is the most high God? Jesus' father, which we see confirmed in the words of the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary in Luke 1, 32. He shall be great, and son of the Most High shall he be called. Even the demons acknowledge this truth in Luke 8, 28, saying, Jesus, Son of God Most High. Jesus is not the Most High God. He is the Son of the Most High God. 1 Corinthians 11:3. Now I want you to be aware that the head of every man is Christ, yet the head of the woman is the man, yet the head of Christ is God. This verse sheds light on the confusion from John 20 that causes many to embrace the false doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus can be a relative God slash placer by being the God slash placer of Thomas without being part of the mythical Trinity, because Christ is the head of Thomas. 1 Timothy 1.12 Grateful am I to him who invigorates me, Christ Jesus our Lord, for he deems me faithful, assigning me a service. Here we see Christ Jesus is the one guiding the Apostle Paul as he assigned Paul a service. The word assigning is from tithemi, the Greek word for placing. Jesus is the one placing Paul into his service, but the placing originates in the Father, the only true placer. 
Deuteronomy 10, 17. For Yahweh, your Elohim, he is the Elohim of Elohim and the Lord of Lords, the El, the Great, the Masterful, and the Fear-inspiring One, who neither shows partiality nor takes a bribe. The scriptures never withhold the fact that there are many gods, slash theoi, slash Elohim, slash placers. Monotheism is a myth, but the scriptures also reveal that there is one God, slash placer, slash Elohim, who is greater than all the others. He is the Most High God. Moses says here to the Israelites, Yahweh your Elohim, he is the Elohim of Elohim. He is indeed the God of gods, the placer of all the other placers, including his only begotten Son. He is the God slash placer and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.3 1 Corinthians 8, 4-7 then concerning the feeding on the idol sacrifices, we are aware that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God except one. For even if so be that there are those being termed gods, whether in heaven or on earth, even as there are many gods and many lords. Nevertheless, for us, there is one God, the Father, out of whom all is, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all is, and we through him. But not in all is there this knowledge. Again, monotheism is not reality, as this passage clearly shows. There are those being termed gods, whether in heaven or on earth, even as there are many gods. But an individual can be a monotheist in the sense that Paul reveals here. For us, there is one God, the Father, out of whom all is, which we saw earlier in Romans 11.36. In the absolute sense, there is no other God except one. There is only one true God, one true placer the Father out of whom all is. Trinitarians are not in line with the Apostle Paul's words. The Trinitarians say, For us there is one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the great triune God out of whom all is. Let's shift gears for a bit and see how two unusual gods slash theoids are also placers, Satan, who is the god of this present wicked eon, and the bowels, a god that controls much of the world. Philippians 3, 18 through 19. For many are walking, of whom I often told you, yet now am lamenting also as I tell it, who are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose consummation is destruction, whose God is their bowels, and whose glory is in their shame, who to the terrestrial are disposed. The bowels is the hollow or the cavity in the middle of a person. It can be the stomach, the womb, some say it can speak figuratively of the heart. These parts of the body drive people and place them so that they can be filled. The person is controlled by their bowels. Romans 16:18 says, For such for our Lord Christ are not slaving, but for their own bowels. A slave goes where his master tells him to go. These people to the terrestrial are disposed, not the things of God. Their God and master is their bowel. Desires can come from our bowels, those desires which can be basically good, desires for food and drink, etc., etc., can drive or place the individual into overindulging those legitimate desires by gluttony, drunkenness, adultery, etc. 2 Corinthians 4, 3-4 now, if our evangel, or good news, is covered, also it is covered in those who are perishing, in whom the God of this eon blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving, so that the illumination of the evangel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, does not irradiate them. Since the adversary, the God of this wicked eon, blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving, he can lead the blind around by deception and place them where he wants to. The adversary told Jesus in the wilderness in Luke 4, 6-7, To you shall I be giving all this authority and the glory of them, all the kingdoms of the inhabited earth, for it has been given up to me, and to whomsoever I may will, I am giving it. If you then should ever be worshipping before me, it will all be yours. The God of this eon can place people into the highest levels of authority throughout the kingdoms of the earth. Now, back to passages showing the Father of Jesus is the only true God slash placer. Ephesians 1, 3, 17, and 20 through 23. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, rousing him from among the dead and seating him at his right hand among the celestials, up over every sovereignty and authority and power and lordship and every name that is named, not only in this eon, but also in that which is impending, and subjects all under his feet and gives him as head over all to the ecclesia, which is his body, the complement of the one completing the all in all. We see the Father as the God slash placer of His Son in verses 3 and 17, and we see Him actually placing the Son, rousing Him from among the dead, seating Him at His right hand among the celestials, up over every sovereignty and authority and power and lordship in every name that is named, and the Father is also the subjector who subjects all under His feet, placing Jesus in the position as head over all. The subjecting and placing by God are putting everything and everyone, including his Son, in the proper place within his creation. 1 Peter 3.22 Jesus Christ is at God's right hand, being gone into heaven, messengers and authorities and powers being subjected to him. Jesus is placed at the placer's right hand in heaven with messengers and authorities and powers being subjected to him. The Father places and the Father subjects. Philippians 3.20-21 for our realm is inherent in the heavens, out of which we are awaiting a Savior also, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transfigure the body of our humiliation to conform it to the body of His glory, in accord with the operation which enables Him even to subject all to Himself. Just as Jesus is called Elohim, Theos, God, and Placer, like His Father, He is also a subjector like His Father, and He is able to subject all to Himself. Obviously, the all that Jesus subjects does not include his father. We see the truth of God being the only true subjector and placer when we look at his final revealed acts during the Aeonian times at the consummation of the eons. This occurs at the consummation of the final eon, which is the new heaven and new earth eon. Here the Apostle Paul takes us far beyond the events in the book of Revelation. Hebrews 1-2 tells us God made the eons through his son. Throughout the Aeonian times, God has been placing everything and everyone in the creation in its proper place at the proper time, like a director sets the actors in place on a stage during their scenes. This is why he is called the Aeonian God slash placer in Romans 16:26. The final acts of the eons reveal our Father as subjector and placer of all, including his beloved Son. 1 Corinthians 15:22 through 28 for even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Yet each in his own class, the first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ's in his presence, thereafter the consummation, whenever he may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished, death. For he subjects all under his feet. Now whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. Now whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28 leads us to the consummation of the Aeonian times and some of the spectacular events that will occur then. Verse 22 tells us, Even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, which means to be made immortal and incorruptible, like Christ, the first fruit of the vivified. God is already there at the consummation when all have been resurrected out of the second death. We saw this alluded to earlier in Luke 20, 38. God is he not of the dead, but of the living, for all to him are living. Verses 23 through 24 tell us the vivification happens in three stages, yet each in his own class. The first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ's in his presence, thereafter the consummation. Christ, the first fruit, has already been vivified. The elect will be vivified in his presence when he returns at the end of this present wicked eon. All who are not made immortal and incorruptible in the second class will be vivified in the third class at the consummation of the 
the eons. Along with that amazing event, the rest of verse 24 through verse 28 reveals some of the other awesome accomplishments that will wrap up the Aeonian times in grand fashion. These accomplishments are attained by God and Christ, finishing their work of placing all and subjecting all. Verse 24, the consummation, whenever Christ may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. The perfected kingdom is moved from the Son to his placer and Father. His reign is thoroughly successful and comes to a satisfying end as he completes placing all his enemies under his feet. Verse 25. And we see from Matthew 22:44, it is the Father, the only true placer, who is placing all enemies under the feet of his Son. Said the Lord to my Lord, sit at my right, till I should be placing thine enemies underneath thy feet. Verse 26, the last enemy is being abolished, death. By rendering death completely inoperative, the result is the vivification of those who were dead in the second death. No aspect of death will remain in God's creation after the success successful reign of the Son of God. No one will experience death operating in them, aka mortality. No one will experience a death event, and no one will be held in the death state. In verse 27, we see the Father is subjecting all through the Son, and placing all under the Son and the Father, Ephesians 1, 22. The Father is the only exception to the all that is placed under the feet of the Son. Then, in verse 28, we see the final revealed act of the Aeonian times the Father actively subjecting the Son to Himself, and the result is that God may be all in all, with the Son being part of the all the Father is in. This is a glorious goal for the eons, God being all in all, and it becomes reality by the subjecting and placing work of the only true placer, our Heavenly Father. The Greek verb translated here six times as subject is hupotasso, and it means to set under or arrange under. All, including Jesus, will be properly set in the right place under the Father when he is all in all. Then God's work of placing, aka godding, throughout the eons will be successful fully completed. The next time you read the scriptures, try using the word placer whenever you see the word God. It will clarify in your mind what the only true God and all other gods are actually doing. And when you get into discussions about God with friend or foe, make it a point to define the word God before you spend two hours, 44 minutes, and 15 seconds of your valuable life talking and disagreeing about a vague God. God loves you and he has placed you and will continue to place you exactly where he wants you to be. Some of you may be in a good place, but some of you may be in a bad place. Please keep this in mind, whether your current place is good or bad or a mixture of the two, God has a purpose for you being exactly where you are. And he will work all things out for your good because he loves you. I invite you to watch this video next. God, God. God, 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 God. Uh, that's impressive. <laughs> uh.